Hello. We are here today to hear a talk about uh, Vertex AI and pipelines. I uh, brought you an interesting topic for the audience. Let's see what we are going to actually cover today. So first of all, we are going to discuss uh, what is MLOps, Machine Learning Ops, doing something like DevOps, but for machine learning purposes for that. Then we will see what is Vertex AI, a product of Google Cloud Platform. We will see the steps to build, train, evaluate, deploy models briefly, because I will talk mostly about using pipelines for your machine learning workflows. So, and none on the last, adapting to changes of data. It's important that when you have MLOps or DevOps uh, automation, you always have a triggering phase, and that's either a scheduler or a data change or a GitHub commit. It's important to see that as well. My name is Marton. I'm Hungarian from Transylvania. As a Romanian software engineer, working for a local company back in Romania, I have a strong profile on Stack Overflow, so I might have answered your questions. And uh, I'm a Google developer expert since 2016. So those are my credentials. I wrote a few articles on Medium. I deactivated the paywall, so you should check next week what those are. And slides and all the resources are available under the Martin Kodok username on SlideShare or on Twitter and so on. So let's see, first part, what is machine learning ops? Well, when we have machine learning code, usually there are a lot of sub-elements of it. Well, we could have, for example, data collection, data verification, it could be feature engineering, even automation, resource management, process management, serving infrastructure, and monitoring, just a few of the palette of the OR stack that could be identified as a separate component of your, let's say, technical depth. Why am I saying this? Because we are going to see what is MLOps in a couple of sentences, like DevOps principles to machine learning systems, or continuous delivery and automation pipeline for machine learning system, just to be on the sides of it. Well, the book and the industry has two levels of automation for the machine learning ops. One is the manual process, but I would say that I call that level zero because any, any process has a manual step of it. Then there is the pipeline automation, and there is the CI-CD pipeline automation. It means that pipelines are the roots for your automation problems. We will see what these are briefly. So when we talk about the manual process, the build and deploy is entirely manual. Probably your organization someday or currently or in the past had all these machine learning deploys manually triggered by someone. It had infrequent release iterations, no CI CD, and it's a disconnection between machine learning and operations. If you may have an operations team or someone has a role that does the operation, or a DevOps team or a sysadmin team and sort of it. Well, this is, I would say, manual process. When we talk about pipeline automation, there is continuous training by automating the machine learning pipeline. It's important to know that by English and reading the sentence is that we accept that there is a pipeline set up by someone and we automate the pipeline itself. You achieve continuous delivery of model prediction, you automate the build, train, deploy pipeline. What you need to understand that the pipeline may contain these three steps and automatically it runs all the three. And new pipelines mostly based on new data because eventually it has the build out data source, training, and then having the deploy phase of the model deploying somewhere. Level two is iteratively try out new machine learning algorithms. So we had here the pipeline somehow created, defi defined. On the CI CD automation, we have try out algorithms. Algorithms are code. So essentially, this is a code change. And code change, the output of the code change is the pipeline definition. So it automatically refers back to the first uh, level of source. So continuously build source code packaging. 
either it could be a commit automation, it could be a deploy to a container, or using containers to actually build out uh, all this source code packaging. Essentially, the steps here are that you are building the source, which is the source code, you run the test, the output is a pipeline. And essentially, if the pipeline and the metrics that you have set up that this is a successful build gets provisioned for a new run, and it replaces your previous pipeline, and the pipeline gets started. Also, we need to mention that essentially the trigger action here is a CI CD operation based on source code or orchestrated experiments. What do I understand under orchestrated experiments and here as well, orchestrated experiment steps? You might have automation or let's say a generator that spans or changes some kind of parameters in your source code. And essentially that change, let's name it a hyperparameter tune, could yield the new source code. The source code itself is a new one. I changed the character or you have changed something. The source code is packaged into a container. It's being built and verified. The container is executed. The container output is a pipeline definition. What I didn't tell you so far is that the pipeline definition is a JSON file. So essentially, all the CI CD source code automation output is a JSON, pi JSON file that, that describes the pipeline. Let's go next. In order to understand better, let's use it in a diagram process, and I go quickly on it. Essentially, we have the manual process that triggers, and ha we have a trainer model. The model itself is being uh, deployed to a prediction service. You may have here a continuous delivery that every train model is automatically deployed to a prediction service. Essentially, new data triggers the train model itself. But if I add buckets to it, we will see how this changes a bit. So level zero is manual process. Level one is when you have the pipeline set up either manually, but someone triggers the pipeline, usually the new data. Level two automation is when we have the source code itself. We have the developer. We have the, let's say, here we have the new data, we have the data analyst. They may change something at the source of the data, but they didn't change the code itself. Here we have the software engineer or developer. They change the code. It is being packaged. The output of the package is a JSON file of the pipeline. Good. If we add additional, uh, additional, uh, I'm losing the word, but you see, if I add additional elements to this process, you essentially see here that the artifacts met, sorry, the model registry could, so sorry, if we introduce the model registry, we could have models in draft candidate or later state. That means that we have version of models, we have artifacts metadata, and we can also do rollback processing of it. Rollback can be done if we have a monitoring of our model. Like, suppose we deployed it, but in production the model doesn't yield the results that we want. The model automate, the system and orchestration can automatically roll back because we have a model registry and we could have a, a different model. What's important to understand that if I do another and the last one on the screen, if we have all this automation based on the source code, like we use the data source, we use a feature store, a data extraction, hyperparameter, anything can change and yield a new build of the pipeline. Based on the pipeline, you could have a lot of draft models, and then if it reaches a certain uh, threshold, it could become a candidate models. And candidate models further by you can be set like, I don't know, 97% accuracy above can be automatically put to the production. Production is the latest one. Here, it's important to have also unit testing because machine learning system has as well unit testing. We are not that dear that every machine learning process implements a unit testing, but it should be there. Okay, 
Let's go further. This was the MLOps uh, steps and to see actually levels of automation. Let's see how Vertex AI resolves this and what is Vertex AI itself. So it's a managed machine learning platform. It means that managed by Google. It's part of the Google Cloud Platform. It's for developers, because on Google, we need to separate that for everyday developer, for developers, for machine learning engineers, for architects, and so on, to build, train, accelerate ML experiments. It's, it's good if you run a lot of experiments or if you have the capacity to actually build machine learning by using experiments. Some companies do that five times a day. Some do only three in a month. But anyway, it's called experiments. And my favorite part is that it lets you to deploy the models like a REST service. So if you are new to this Vertex AI platform, instead of concept of deploying a website or deploying an API, you are deploying here a built model or a trained model, and you can consume the service with the REST API. All this offered by you by a managed platform. What's included in Vertex AI? Well, these elements. What are these elements? Actually, this change every two weeks because Google Cloud adds, adds additional new elements. Essentially, on top, there are the ways that how you build out the model itself. I would say that you have the custom models, either by Python code, Java, Node.js, whatever, or assembled as a container itself. This is a custom model, and companies who build out custom models, they can bring their, their custom models as well. If you want to leverage, for example, BigQuery models, they offer this service in preview for like three weeks. Now, it means that all the 20 options that BigQuery machine learning has can be automated as a component in Vertex AI. What are the two benefits? Because someone asked me previously, BigQuery machine learning didn't have batch prediction. Every new prediction should be a row in BigQuery. By deploying to the Vertex AI system, you have possibility to do batch prediction. Like your input could be thousands, and the model itself responds with the thousands prediction. And there is AutoML. Sorry, AutoML, it has been already briefly touched today at uh, Picard's talk. It's basically a no developer way to build out machine learning for certain scopes for it, like vision, video, language, translation tables. There are a couple of models under it. What else is here? Because these are actually the models, but you have here the training phase. That builds out the model. Once the model is done, you have an endpoint. That's the REST service. And there, your prediction happens for you. You can define also experiments in the system. This is optional. And also, you have features for data labeling data sets for all the organizations who work with large data sets and they have a data analyst uh, at hand. Also, there are visual optimization AI accelerators to actually help you to deep dive into the model and to see why certain elements of your input behave or not behave like you wanted. Like, for example, imagine a picture and it could tell you that this part of the picture is the essential to that uh, prediction. And then you need to add more pictures in order to target the other section that you identified. Pipelines connects all these, and uh, essentially it lets you to build out all the elements of it. Where does Vertex AI fit in? Because you may think that this is a closed system. Well, it's not a closed system. It's a way to do something, but it works in favor for, for you. What it means that in the Google Cloud Platform, you have the Vertex AI. But with the endpoints, you have access to it outside as well. So essentially, you can have an application, either on other cloud or on-premise, that connects to the API of the Vertex AI and pulls or runs the prediction itself. And you can then use that on mobile or a desktop client. This is also important because connecting directly Vertex AI with, a, let's say, mobile and desktop client has a latency, and you need to cache things. Uh, serving a model is not like that, so it's, it has a 600 milliseconds or three seconds uh, latency. 
depending how complex the, fellow, the, the subject is. But it's not instantly. And you need to cache it with, uh, with, with your backend to say so. Good. Hopefully, oh, I didn't want this step. So essentially, it's a serverless platform. I don't want to spend too much time to, to actually mention what's it. What we need to understand is that we are not deploying a function. We are not deploying a container. We are having a model as a service. And it has open SDK to integrate with the components, pipelines, and machine learning frameworks with it. And also, the pricing model is based on usage because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's packaged as a serverless uh, platform. Use cases. As I mentioned, AutoML, custom models, BigQuery, these three items could be your source of information, essentially built out uh, based on a model objective. It builds out a Vertex AI model, and the model itself is deployable to Vertex AI endpoints, and it's being served by a computer. The model itself can be extracted, so I should have added here another box that says that the model built, out, built can be exported and you can serve it in other platforms as well. Later, in the pipeline section, you could have a workflow that you built out a model optimized for mobile devices or you built out a model optimized for desktop cons consumption. So the pipeline can actually build out the whole uh, workflow and to actually uh, build out two separate uh, options. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the AutoML, uh, sorry, to the Vertex AI dashboard. So this is the dashboard itself. What we need to see that we have data sets, features, labeling tasks, pipelines, training models, metadata, and so on. If you go to the data set section, and if you go to the create, here you have all the AutoML objectives that you can actually try out if you are new to the platform. Let me see if they fit on the four column section. Image classification, multi-label object detection, image segmentation, the tabular data, for example, regression, forecasting, text, entity extraction, multi-label, sentiment analysis. You have seen sentiment analysis uh, demo today from from the Picard talk. You have video, ac video ac action recognition, classification, object tracking. So next, there is a small demo that uh, I have put together. So here you will see flowers. These are the categories. This is a mistake. And what I added here is that there are a few categories of flowers. Each category has uh, around 600 elements. And I used uh, this AutoML model to actually, sorry, this AutoML objective to build out a model, to train it, to deploy it to an endpoint. And then I created a little application to actually consume that endpoint. My little application is hopefully will load here. This is a separate website I put together, and in the background, it's, it's calling the endpoint of, of the deployment. So essentially, if I do the predict on the row system, you will see here that it predicted 100%, but don't pay attention to this because it's just a playground demo for it. And also the sunflower, uh, it predicted sunflowers and uh, 100%. And here I have a dog, and it predicts a tulip, and 89%. Just a quick lesson, when you have an outsider model, this is not a, it's, it's actually, this should behave like this. What you need to actually do is that when you have an outsider model, sorry, when you have an outsider element of it, you need to train a not a label class. So, I keep discussing with developers, and they don't have an outlier label class. Always, if you have 10 classes that you identify, you need to have an 11th one, and train all the garbage to there. 
the model itself will validate. If I would train a garbage label, automatically it will be providing a prediction. Because it's a strict, like machine learning, it's a strict process. You have 10 labels. It needs to give you one of the 10 labels and the accuracy to it. Good. In the background, let me show you the pipeline code. Hopefully. No. I will show you later. So, um, well, what it happened? I uploaded a bunch of fo a bunch of files to cloud storage. I either you can label different ways. Uh, you can label with a JSON descriptive file. Like you can generate with your favorite programming language a JSON file that has all the all the all the URLs to the file and the label itself that you label it, or you can use the interface. I'm not going back to the interface, but you can actually leverage the interface to to train uh, and do some changes on the interface as well. And the rest of that is uh, already has been told to you. This is in case I cannot run the the demo itself. So part three, using pipelines. So we are back to this uh, stack, and now we are going to see the pipelines. And what are the usefulness of the pipelines? Well, essentially, it orchestrates things. And as a manager, you will want to have an orchestrated way to do things. No handle as a monolith everything, and uh, should be each, each, each objective of your machine learning uh, ops should be a step itself. Adopt machine learning for production models. So you could have a repeatable, verifiable, automatic process for making any change to a production model. Like we have with the GitHub commits, it's, if in certain, uh, if it's certain uh, branch, it happens a commit itself, like on the end result of a pull request, it will automatically build out, for example, a Jenkins jobs or whatever. Here as well, you could have a, a verifiable way to actually do production models itself. My favorite actually is that I work a lot with juniors, and I work with different teams, also consultants, because in machine learning you may need an external consultant for a limited time. You, when you have this protocol in place, you develop steps independently. As you scale out, it enables you to share your machine learning workflow with others. What this means? It means that Pipeline steps are separately, and pipeline steps are also cached. So if you rerun the pipeline, those steps who are not changed in the state, they are not re-executed. In a practical way, for example, someone could modify the very first element of the pipeline, data. It could produce the entire workflow, the entire training phase, everything. But someone could modify the deployment. Instead of three nodes, I want 20 nodes, or I want auto-scaling. Then I don't need to rebuild all the steps. I don't need to wait six hours for training, because I'm modifying only the last step. And the power to have this configuration change, or have a UI or an internal system to modify the scalability is good because you have a pipeline. You don't need to run everything. You set it as a pipeline and you modify all the elements of it. Now, visually, you may have a gathering, get the data, like you store somewhere the, you, the data, you grab the data, you train the model, the model pod produces you artifacts. These little, article, these little icons are artifacts. Well, from the data, you could have a split, 80% for training, 20% for eval. These are the artifacts that you see here on the, on the get data. Get data is your function or is your step. Someone from your team created this process. The train itself, it could be your training or it could be an AutoML objective, the training process. The training creates the model itself. This little icon is the model in the perspective of it. And then you have the eval section. The eval section creates metadata that you define. It could be accuracy numbers. It could be any other attributes to it. 
in the in the code section, this is limited and it's Python because it's much more compact to put on screen and to actually do a presentation on it, but you can do in Node.js and Java as well. I will start with the bottom. The bottom is that there is a JSON file created by a process. That JSON file is the input to run the pipeline. That JSON file is created by the previous operation, and the previous operation, the pipeline is here. You have the data set, essentially this part that get data. You have the training process. You have here the training data set train. Data set train is coming from here. Data set up outputs that the training section. You have eval and so on. So essentially, in order to build out a pipeline, you need to run double of this code because this is reduced a bit. You have the full example linked if you want to uh, if you want to play with this. So I'm showing you gathering data, training the model, but essentially we need to have a deploy phase. The deploy phase, this is the training process, but there is an endpoint creation. Endpoint creation creates here the REST endpoint, and essentially it deploys a model under that REST endpoint. That's the pipeline uh, configuration. Here I have totally different code, why I brought you two examples? Because here we are leveraging Google Cloud Pipeline components. There are libraries automatically created for you that are easier to actually do operations like image data set create or auto image training job run operation. These are pi part of the pipeline. These are not my code. My code. Actually, I'm calling an AutoML initiative for that and point create operation model as well. It compiles the output as a JSON, and the pipeline job triggers based on the input. <coughs> what you need to, need to understand that this JSON file could actually come from cloud storage. It shouldn't be visualized and think that automatically that JSON file is picked up. You could have a separate process, like that JSON file is generated, it's put on cloud storage, and there, for an event, that event, event, you react to it, get the JSON file, and start the pipeline for it. Next one. What I want to show here is that you have Python, Java, Node.js reference for the client libraries, and you have different, uh, in the manual, you have different uh, components that you can automate. Artifact data types, data flow, data pro, custom job, usually if you bring your own model to training and not using AutoML or BigQuery automations, these custom jump components are the first that you will visit and you will define your pipeline steps. The batch prediction, because normally when you deploy the model, you want to actually get the prediction to it, and if you have a large model, you want to use batch prediction component as well. Model and endpoint, Vertex AI, the AutoML components, BigQuery, hyperparameter tuning. So there are lots of components, and I want, don't want to actually uh, implement them. It's for developers, but they are, they are on, the, on the manual as well. Well, the third example, the first one, gathering data, training the model, and creating a deployment. Now I want to add, a, let's say, a decision that I want to deploy my model only if it has a certain accuracy. In the chart, creating the model, running the training, I have the model, and I want to do here this deployment based on a condition. So I need to have an eval of the model, and if the eval of the model reports the accuracy that I set up, only that time deploys the model. This is the code to actually do something for production. What's interesting is that here you could have also that phase that some models are trained for mobile specific use case, some are trained for desktop use as well. Well, it's a long list to uh, say here. Essentially, you can share component specification. This is also in YAML uh, descriptive way. You will see that when you build out components, you have certain uh, specification that you can uh, actually add, uh, add there. This can be added to the Git repository as well. 
You can load from URL. This means that if you have a JSON file placed on Google Cloud Storage, you have a function directly to call that. You can leverage step caching to develop and debug. And you have metadata service and lineage tracking for those that you want to actually track all the metadata that you edit as well. Uh, as an advantage, no more Kubeflow pipelines. Essentially, there are organizations who are done this in a Kubernetes cluster, but they are doing in a Kubeflow pipelines that automatically can be eliminated, and it's a, it's a box, it's a out of the box replacements of those. Uh, good. Let me see if. Okay, yeah, here. I've run this previously on previously before the talk because it takes time to actually run the training process. I have here an initialization phase. Um, I installed uh, some kind of components here, you see. And if I let them this all happen, then I have the code for the pipeline, some imports. I'm setting a name uh, here for the pipeline. And uh, here is the folder. And the schema itself, so I'm using Vertex AI image single label classification objective. So this is our thermal process for it. Then I have the pipeline's steps. Here is the training. Here is creating the endpoint in this region under this name. Here is the deployment of the model itself. So essentially, if I run this, hopefully, it creates a pipeline. You will see here a couple of pipelines. And this one is the one that's executed right now. It took two seconds. Why it took two seconds? Because every step is already pre-run and it's cached. So if I want to retrain the process, it takes around 13 minutes in order to rerun the process. But for example, if I want to change here, let uh, the replica, the max replica is three, I can run another process. And here we will see that uh, it took seven seconds, a bit longer because it had to configure uh, a configuration process as well. And it's still running. So when I open up the pipeline, I'm seeing that uh, this, uh, this is done. So essentially, this icon shows me that it's running. So the previous steps are actually cached. And now, my deployment model will be rescaled with the parameters that I uh, set it up. Good. I want to go further. Um, just to see what we have touched, we have the, the pipelines that use data sets training. We had a model. We had an endpoint. We run a prediction. We had some metadata discussed for the EVAR process as well. The last part, and this is usually the most important part. If you run a pipeline, you need to react to changes. And here is the important process. Like, it's only one slide, but it, it has a lot of items in it. You could have a simple scheduler. When we are using scheduler, this is the first step if you are new to the pipelines. We have set up a scheduler to start building models at 8 p.m. What that mean, meant? During the day, the developers actually worked on the code, and the build process was like six, seven hours. So after they left the office to say so, we have scheduled that 8 p.m. is a good time to actually trigger the job, see the run over the night the model training, and in the morning, they will see the evaluation, and they do the next day task based on that. We have used cloud workflows for this, because you can set a cloud scheduler that triggers a cloud workflow. And in the cloud workflow, you add uh, the pipeline trigger itself, because something needs to launch the pipeline. And that was cloud workflow. Next, there is cloud build. Who uses cloud build on Google Cloud Platform? Cloud build is extremely versatile execution system that actually lets you to build essentially containers, but anything that's a share command. And that's 
where it helps you because it has itself has a trigger system, so you could have, for example, a GitHub repos commit system to actually build out a cloud build job for you. It will uh, trigger the job itself. It will build out the code itself, and the code, the end result of the code is the JSON file. So essentially, the JSON file lands on cloud storage. Once the one lands on the cloud storage, automatically could trigger a pipeline. There are various ways to actually trigger the pipeline, either with cloud functions, with events, or using cloud workflows as well with, uh, with this system. Essentially, this means that the cloud storage, when, the cloud stor when there is a new file on cloud storage, the pipeline will kick in. Also, you have an image to cloud registry in case you want to inspect it, or nowadays, I see that financial companies who are restrictive to use cloud and more, more for the machine learning operations, they need the images audited. And the Google Cloud Platform offers you binary authorization and customer encryption case. And with these two, the highest audits are also met because the binary authorization tells them that only my software, my enlisted software is in the container, the checksum matches, and the customer encryption key it means that it's enclosed, I know the key, and when I want to deal with the service, I need to press the key in order to use it. The third one, and the last one, is Event Arc. Event Arc is, let's say, a new product offering of the Google Cloud Platform. It's a universal detection observer system. So anything that leaves a log or emits an event, even TAR can pick it out and automate something else. And this is an interesting product because essentially you react to cloud events, whatever event. So if I go back to the cloud build section, when a specific file landed in a bucket in a cloud storage, that emits an event or it could be even be Let's say you leave a log message somewhere with a specific structure, and EventArc can detect that and react to events. EventArc is the replacement of the scheduler. The scheduler started at 8 p.m. EventArc uh, starts when the, when the event or the log happens. And it triggers also other systems like Cloud Workflow Functions, Cloud Run, and Pipeline as well. OK, conclusions. So, you can build with groundbreaking machine learning tools that power Google. It's approachable for non-machine learning developer because it offers AutoML, it offers components, but it also handles custom cases when you are building your custom model. It has end-to-end -end integration for data and AI with built pipelines. It has GitOps-style continuous delivery and other elements like explainable AI, Tensor, TensorBoar, or feature store managed data sets that actually let you to track machine learning experiments. I love to be in the process where my team can say that in the next two weeks, we are proposing 20 experiments. And we have a way to actually manage those and see the helpfulness of them. If there is no change in any other process, that's full cache pipeline. It doesn't count, count as an experiment. The experiment counts when you actually do the training process as well. So it cannot tell you that, hey, I built out a new training process, because it could be nonsense. You are not there to validate them. But in case that re they rebuild the entire training phase, it's there for you. And also, you can have a generator if you want to actually build out certain systems uh, in order to generate code, generate experiments for it. This was briefly my talk about uh, Vertex AI pipelines. Slides are available on SlideShare. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer right now or shortly later in this corner here before the stage. Thank you for being here. <laughs>